And here we're going to look at the plate closer again, once again. Uh, red channel, green channel, blue channel. So a few things to know about this plate. This is obviously uh, HD 1080 formatted image. Now, this plate was digitized, scanned with a film scanner at some point, and most likely it would have been scanned at either 2K or 4K. So what we have here is a downsampled, meaning scaled down version of the original scan, uh, exported when we when we licensed this plate, it was exported uh, as a QuickTime, and I believe the codec that was used was ProRes uh, when we licensed it. So there is already um, some transformation, meaning a scaling down of the image and potentially some compression already applied here. So there's not much that we can do about that. Uh, and the reason I say that is that the nature of the noise or the grain uh, is such that to from experience I can say that it's not it does look like film grain but there's something else going on here which looks a little bit like some kind of uh, either compression artifacts or something like that so the noise is looking very very sharp and almost kind of one pixel like at the time which means that it's slightly different than film grain I'm noticing some electronic bending noise or you know bending horizontal bends every now and then, uh, which to me uh, means that there might be some compression applied to this, but it's not the end of the world. What we need to do is to analyze the existing structure of that noise uh, slash grain and apply it to our CG. So FYI, there is a distinction uh, between what we call noise and what we call grain. Noise, typically, when we say the noise, that means that we're talking about a, an electronic response at the sensor level uh, when you're converting the analog signal to digital. That usually happens uh, either in the circuitry of the, uh, that lies around the uh, sensor, around the chip, or on more modern uh, sensors, that conversion happens on the chip itself. Nevertheless, there is a certain amount of noise, electronic noise that comes with that conversion process, and it translates itself as noise visible in the image because we're amplifying a particular signal. And by doing this amplification, we generate a bit of electronic noise, which we, we see as noise, as little points uh, in the image. When it comes to film grain, the, the, the process is different. What we end up seeing is how these crystals, uh, those silver crystals, depending on the kind of film, the, the type of technology that is used, either T-grain, for example, is a type of technology developed by Kodak. When the film is developed, uh, the, the structure, the crystalline structure inside the, the, the film, inside the uh, emulsion, uh, registers as little clumps of silver of different densities and different responses to light, the red, green and blue channels would look slightly different in terms of what the noise or the grain looks like. So even though you end up with something that looks like spotty little patterns in your image, whether we're talking about an electronic image or a film image, the result or the actual the process that generates this, uh, this noise or grain is obviously different. In our case here, we simply want to use an area of flat value somewhere, in instance, the sky here, use a tool to analyze that and reproduce the pattern. And we'll be using a built-in tool. There are many different tools out there to create or to replicate the grain. Uh, some very, very uh, um, clever solutions like Das Grain or uh, Sapphire had a grain uh, regraining tool at some point. Uh, there are many different ways of doing that. Uh, you can even scan a gray card and use it as a source for generating the grain. But here we'll just use a F underscore regrain node, furnace regrain. And this node has two inputs. So it has a source input and a grain input. So we'll connect this F regrain to our plate, the grain here. When we do that, uh, F regrain presents a sampling area or sampling box. So it's telling us to move the analysis region to analyze the grain. So we'll be putting this somewhere 
the sky something, you know, in something relatively flat. Obviously, we try to find a place in the sky which is not completely overexposed and reddish, or something that's very bluish, somewhere in the middle, which appears to be somewhere uh, so right around here. Now that we've done that, we're going to create, uh, we're going to hit Analyze. And in the Analysis region, uh, there is going to be, uh, you know, some analysis going inside here. And we want to make sure that we switch the uh, grain color splays to linear because the plate that we have here is an EXR plate, which is a linear plate, and we can analyze the result again. Now, once we've done that, let's see the result of what the F regrain node generates. We're going to create a constant. Uh, constant is essentially a static uh, solid image. We can give it any value. And why don't we set it to 0.5, which is basically 50% gray. And we're going to connect this F free grain to this gray node here. And we're going to select the F free grain and hit one. And if we observe carefully, we zoom in, we see the result of what the grain or the noise in this instance, or we can call it grain because it is originally a film grain. If we compare our gray card uh, with the noise or the grain applied, we can see that it's pretty consistent with the source. And we can go to another frame and we'll see that this grain is obviously moving uh, with every frame, which is exactly what we want. Now that we have done that and save our script, this is going to become the grain that we're going to apply to anything that has been computer generated, uh, our explosion, the helicopter and everything else. So we can just select this, copy it. We can navigate down to the bottom of our tree here. And right after the liquify here, that's where we will be applying uh, the film grain. So before we do that, if you remember, I did mention that we needed to make sure that anything that has an alpha channel receives, when we're doing color grading, that uh, anything that has an alpha channel will need to be unpremultiplied to make sure that the areas that are semi-transparent also receive any kind of color grading uh, fully. Otherwise, it would only be partial because those pixels are transparent. Well, the same is true for the grain. And the way, the way we want to make sure that the grain that we're going to apply to our CG here is really done properly or fully, we're going to unpremultiply this. And we are going to paste our, our grain node here with the source. And we'll pre-multiply this afterwards to go back to a result that's similar to what we have in the uh, right after the liquify node here. And if we observe very carefully, I'm going to zoom into the image. If we look at the liquify, and if we look at the result here, there's a bit of noise, a little bit of a grain uh, structure. I'm not sure how well in this recording it's visible, but if you are following along inside of Nuke, you will notice that the image has a little bit of noise uh, visible inside of it. Now, just to make sure that the analysis here Technically, the grain, the regrain node should uh, store this information and replicate the noise. But here you can see if we double click on it, it's telling us uh, analyze again. So to make sure that we have uh, the grain node sourcing the original grain pattern properly, we'll just copy and paste the plate node next to it. And we'll make sure that it's there. In case you need to readjust the grain, you can have that analysis be done for you, but you need to make sure that the plate is connected to the grain input here. So let's go back inside of this regrain. Let's see the final result. We select this merge node and hit one and double click on the F regrain. And we are going to click on analyze again once more. And if we look very carefully now, you can see that our DG, anything that is a uh, helicopter, fire and everything, the noise that is applied to it now, it's very consistent with the noise that we see in the plate, the grain that we see in the plate. And if we feel like this is maybe a little bit too much, we can always go back and, you know, tweak the results here. Grain amount is the slider upon which we, uh, we can act to reduce the overall amount of grain if we want it to. So here by default, it's at one. We can just bring it down a little bit by about 20% just to make sure that we're not overdoing it uh, because 
what happens is that this element here, the CG element, being semi-transparent, if we apply the grain to it, the underlying structure, the plate behind the semi-transparent areas, they also have grain. So you don't want to overlay grain on top of grain. So this is why you can reduce slightly the power or how much grain you're applying to, to your CG. But as you're making this change, you can inspect things around, look around, and make sure that things are pretty consistent. And you will see that there is a very, very nice, seamless uh, way of combining the CG with the plate by using grade as a grain as a way to uh, kind of glue to glue things together. And you will see that the liquify node probably needs a little bit more of a uh, readjustment here, here and there. So feel free to do that until you get the result that you want. And you may even want to possibly even blur this. I think this will soften some of the brush strokes and some of the effect overall, but you don't want to overdo that too much. Otherwise, everything else is going to shift. So uh, have at it, guys. Uh, this is almost the final, final step. Of course, the result of that, of all the work that we've done, we got to do two or three more things here. Uh, if you remember, we're organizing, keeping things very clear, very neat, neatly labeled. And I think we should still do that and add some backdrops uh, to make sure that everything else here makes sense. If we reopen the script or pass it to somebody else or have somebody take over, we want to make sure that they understand what's going on here. So we'll put a backdrop here. This one, we'll call it distortion. So the backdrop doesn't need to be so huge, just enough to label everything properly, uh, or to include everything. We can call this distortion. And here we are going to bring the rest of the nodes down, like so. And then a little bit more space on the last few ones at the bottom here. And here I will call this wall roto. If you remember, that's the little animated or tracked shape that we use to uh, cut the rest of the uh, CG. So wall roto. Uh, and here we'll call that the liquify. And finally, here we have the film grain. Okay, so make sure you save your script. And now what we want to do is prepare the final uh, step, which is rendering out these files, this is the process here, as files. And for that, we'll hit W for write. We'll connect this here, write node to our to the rest of our tree. And let's take a look how we're going to call things. So let's click on the file, the folder at the very end of the, the field that says file. We'll click on that. And let's go to BHK10 and we'll go to render comp. So I already have that rendered, pre-rendered, but let's create another version. Let's call it, so we are now version two. Uh, as you can see, the name of the script is comp underscore B002, if you look at the very top of your screen. So this will be the name of the folder. Okay, so we can select that, copy it, right after the slash, control V again, and the syntax to write out sync, a sequential file, uh, uh, a sequential file sequence uh, is to type dot percent zero four D dot exr. There's another syntax you can use is pound, 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 dot exr. Both will work. I tend to use the old school 04D C syntax, 0% uh, 04D. And you will see if we zoom in, as we move along on the timeline, the file, the numbering for the file will also change. So now that I have done that, I can double click here and verify that the color space, the output transform, the ODT, uh, using the uh, ACES uh, naming, output device transform, uh, is going to be set to scene linear default. 
It should be set to C linear, linear because we are writing out linear light files, EXR. And we also want to make sure that create directory is active because if you remember in the syntax that we typed, we have the render, so the shot, BHK10, render, comp. And inside of that, we have another subdirectory called BHK comp v002. And inside of this directory, we have the files that we're writing out. So this particular directory, comp v002, has not been created yet. We just typed its, typed its, its name, but the directory itself has not been created. So you can create the directory for you at render time. And to enable that, we want to make sure that we click on create directories here. And now we're ready to hit render. And we want to make sure that this render uh, frame range is set to global. And if you have that not showing the right uh, frame range, that means that in your render or project settings, I'm going to go ahead, cancel here, click on the gray area of your node graph, hit S. We look at our frame range here. We have to make sure that we're using the correct one, which is 1280 to 1500. We can even say lock range. Save your script again, double click on the right node and hit render again. And this time in global, it will take the correct frame range. So you can launch the render locally on your machine and which I'm about to do now. And you'll see you have about 220 frames to render. Uh, I'm working on the mid-class, you know, previous generation machine. So it's not exceedingly fast, but it's not too slow either. Depending on the hardware that you're running on, uh, this will be more or, you know, more or less fast. Uh, and at the end of uh, those four minutes of render time, you will have a fully uh, rendered file sequence, which you can load back into Nuke and inspect. So we'll do this. I'll let this run. And once it's done, we'll load the final result here.